Welcome to the How to Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today I'm so honored to have two beautiful souls in front of me. So they're both doctors. Well, let's start with Dr. Arjun Raya Pudi. I think I got it right. <laughs> they're married, husband and wife. So um, just to give you some background, Dr. Um, well, Arjun is a general surgeon, but he's also, he does endoscopies in rural Newfoundland at Burren Hospital and is incredible. He's done, let's see, you're certified by the American Board of Surgery. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Um, did his training at the University of Florida and the University of Illinois in Peoria. Um, he also, I guess he's got his medical degree, forgive me if I say this wrong, Rangaraya? How do you say it? It's Rangaraya Medical College. There you go, okay. And you've also had some education, of course, from <clears throat> the plant-based world as far as the, um, you know, T. Colin Campbell's uh, plant-based certificate at Cornell. And then you work, it looks like you did some stuff with Dr. McDougall as well. Um, but incredible story. And you work a lot, I'm hearing. <laughs> you do. So some great stories. And then we have Dr. Shobha Rayapudi, who's got a really interesting background as an epidemiologist in the U.S. with her training, also went to medical school. Did you go to medical school also? In Rangaraya Medical School. And same. Okay, very good. And, oh, yeah, from right here. And then um, you got your training to do epidemiology, running things um, at John Hopkins in Baltimore. But, I mean, you were running centers across the United States. I mean, you were a smart cookie. <laughs> <laughs> so really impressive. And you have a, a beautiful 13-year-old um, and a veggie-loving dog, it says here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. She but you, all the veggies in the house. <laughs> But you guys co-founded um, the Gift of Life and, and giftoflife.org, <laughs> Gift of Health, excuse me, giftofhealth.org. And um, it's a really awesome thing that you're doing. You're working with your community and holding workshops and just a really cool story. And I don't want to keep talking. You guys tell your different versions of this story. <laughs> and and the audience will understand shortly. But who would like to start with? First of all, let's learn to get you. Let's learn about how you guys found the plant-based diet, how this came together. Did you find it together? Was it separate? Who would like to start? It's up to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's uh, uh, like uh, I finished my residency training in uh, University of Florida and I came uh, to Buren, uh, Newfoundland. This is the first uh, job as a surgeon I, I took, and uh, I walked into my clinic, and the, my clinics were already overbooked. And like the wait times to see me for like with if you want to have a, a procedure like endoscopy or gallbladder surgery was almost like three to six months. And right, right, that's right from the get go. And I didn't expect to be that busy right from uh, day one. Like. I finished my training in Jacksonville and for that kind of practice to build in Jacksonville, it might take about five, five years at least. But here uh, I was busy from day one and I was also seeing a, a, a number of patients with advanced cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, stomach cancer. Uh, the thing is I was one of the two, uh, I'm one of the two surgeons for next uh, 150, uh, 160 kilometers. So we serve about 35,000 uh, uh, people in this area and there are no gastroenterologists. So I was quite busy doing the gastroenterology work and also taking care of uh, these patients with uh, advanced cancers. I was scratching my head like, you know, why, what's going on here? Why there is so much cancer, uh, especially like cancer in young people, like 42 year old uh, with uh, advanced bowel cancer. Uh, and I had a 44 year old uh, uh, mother and a uh, uh, home, um, homemaker uh, with uh, uh, like advanced uh, breast cancer. And despite uh, doing uh, everything we can, like uh, chemotherapy, radiation, and uh, uh, surgery, we could not save her. Oh. And uh, I was looking for answers, like, you know, what's going on here? Why there is so much disease here? And uh, when I looked around and asked for the answers, and most of the answers I got from my senior colleagues here was, uh, you know, Newfoundland has bad genes. And that didn't make any sense. So how could, uh, you know, these many people and living in a, such a beautiful 
uh, serene uh, place with clean air and access to uh, uh, clean water? How can there could be you know such concentrated bad genes that didn't that didn't sync with me? But I was so busy, I kept working. <laughs> and on one of the days, uh, at the end of the day, I was flipping through the Netflix. Uh, documentaries and I landed up uh, watching Forks of One Eyes and it talked about uh, how uh, so the, uh, if, if people didn't get it it's Forks Over Knives so it's the, that's the documentary it talked about the negative effects of the animal based foods and uh, the healing power of the plant based foods and then I went back I went back to my background because I already had a background in nutrition I, I did masters in public health nutrition before starting my surgery residency so I went back to uh, the journals and the research, looked at the original articles, uh, spent almost a year going over uh, several hundred articles. And I was amazed that the evidence of a connection between the food and the health has always been there. It's just that I didn't know about it. It, it was not something that was taught to me in medical school or residency training. And then uh, uh, I, that led me to pursue the plant-based nutrition course at uh, uh, Cornell. And then I got introduced to Dr. McDougall, Dr. Neil Barner, Dr. Colin Campbell, Dr. Esselstein, Dr. Joel Fuhrman, Dr. Michael Greger, all the um, people who have dedicated their uh, life to bringing this message of plant-based nutrition to the, the masses. And uh, I started applying these principles with my patients. And I saw like that, <laughs> the, 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 some diseases are like so difficult to treat with the conventional medicine, like acid reflux. Uh, you put them on medications for uh, years and years and years, uh, or something like uh, irritable bowels or like hemorrhoids and constipation. And uh, these kind of, these, these diseases, uh, uh, like going away within days to weeks when I, uh, when I uh, guided them towards a plant-based eating. So, uh, and the other thing is, uh, uh, one of my, the most common surgeries that I do is uh, polycystectomy, which is taking uh, the Galbert route. Uh, we do it laparoscopically most of the time. And uh, my approach to these patients has changed. After I learned about this plant-based medicine, I started offering this to the patients and I would give them both options. You know, you, you can change your diet and lifestyle and probably avoid getting their tax and uh, uh, you could, avoid having a surgery or you know I'm trained to do surgery I could do your surgery I could take a Galbert route I give them both options and uh, uh, some patients said like okay you know what I don't want to change my dental life so I just want to go with the surgery and I explain the risks and benefits and you do your best to help them but there are uh, a group of patients who said you know what I'll change my dietary lifestyle. I'll follow up with you. And these patients, they kept coming back every three months, every six months follow-ups. I have patients who have been following for the last uh, five and a half years. Uh, there are uh, close to 50 patients, about half of them. Uh, who for, uh, about the patients who stuck with the plant-based diet, uh, like 95 to 99% of, the time, 99 of them did not end up having any cholecystectomy. So avoiding surgeries and doing all of this with my patients. And that's when... Uh, uh, another returning point came in my life with uh, my dad's declining health. Uh, three years ago, uh, my dad started having uh, shorts of breath. And uh, for most of his life, he struggled with uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, which is a recipe for heart disease. And uh, he ended up uh, having an angiogram, which is a special x-ray of the heart. And he had 90% blockages in two out of the three main blood vessels that supply the heart. And one cardiologist said he needs to have stents. Another cardiologist said he needs to have bypass surgery. Mm. That was a, a very tough time for my family. Uh, when he shared the news of his heart vessels being blocked, I felt as though mine had been broken. Oh. I asked him, instead of having his chest cut open, why don't you open his mouth and put <laughs> different foods? <laughs> and how did that go? He thought I was crazy. <laughs> I said, you know, I worked all my life to send you medical school and like to, to, to US and like, you know, you did all the residency and you're doing surgery. And I have two cardiologists telling me that I need to have bypass surgery the same week. 
our resistance is the same week and now you're telling me that I don't, I don't need any of that. I just need to change your diet. And like, I don't believe you. I'm like, you know what? Just, there is so much evidence to it. It's just that your doctor haven't heard about it. You know, listen to me for a few days and he decided, he said he was going to give two weeks. He decided to try it for two weeks. Two weeks later, he was walking longer distances with no shots of breath. And his blood sugar control was so good that uh, his uh, doctor had to cut his diabetic dose by 50%. Wow. Then he became a believer because his body was telling him that he was, uh, he was doing the right thing. You know, he's a very smart guy. So, <laughs> so then he started following everything to the T. We sent him a copy of uh, Dr. Rob, uh, Dr. Neil Bernard's uh, Prevent and Reverse Diabetes uh, book and uh, Dr. Esselstein's uh, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease book. He started reading everything to the T and following it, everything to the T. Three months later, he came off of his diabetic medications, blood pressure medications, cholesterol medications, five medications that he was taking for over 25 years. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and six months later, he finished the heart the treadmill stresses that he could not even barely, uh, you know, he, he didn't even get to like, you know, half, uh, doing half of it. So he was able to ace that and that was uh, three years ago. Uh, and he's doing so well. He didn't have any stents. He didn't have any bypass surgery. What did uh, his heart doctor say? Did he follow up with them? I mean, they yeah, were like... he followed up with them and uh, they were amazed that uh, they, they didn't initially uh, uh, like uh, think it was a good idea. Actually, in fact, uh, the cardiologist who he was seeing in India and uh, some of my, these are some of my close friends who I grew up with and did the training in the most prestigious places in uh, India. Uh, it's not just in India, even in the uh, US or Canada, there is a lot of resistance uh, to this approach where patients can actually uh, reverse their heart disease with just plant-based medicine. There, there is a resistance there. And we felt quite a bit of resistance when my dad tried to do that. But the thing is, uh, well, we stuck as, uh, as family together we uh, like both of us were on, on phone with my mom and my dad almost every day in the morning and evening. And like, you know, uh, we would give uh, my mom instructions, you know, what to do, what to cook, how to cook and all, because we were already doing this at home. Mm -hmm. So my mom made sure the food is tasty and uh, my dad, he doesn't know how to cook. He just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, actually there was a resistance, not only from the doctors, the resistance from the family, right? Resistance from the family because uh, uh, like I have uh, two bro uh, one brother, two sisters, and we have an extended family, and everyone thought like, you know, what if dad gets a heart attack, like in these two weeks, right? But uh, fortunately, we had, uh, um, you know, the, the right knowledge and right information. Uh, We've seen it working, and uh, uh, I spoke to Dr. Esselstein myself. I sent... Um, message to Dr. Sustain about my dad's this uh, condition and uh, he uh, called me back the same day. I didn't expect, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, he, I, uh, he called me back the same day and we were on phone call uh, for a six minutes, uh, 20 seconds. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, Arjun, if you're, this, these were his words, I can't do his accent, but <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, Arjun, if your dad wants to live longer, and healthier, no stents, no bypass surgery, just plant-based foods. And uh, I took the same message back to my family. And uh, once my dad started feeling better and like, you know, as we say, we get this a lot from a lot of patients as well. Like, you know, will this work? And what the hell are you doing? Uh, you know, initially people will say, what the hell are you doing? And the next few weeks later, they'll say, oh, how are you doing? You know, how did you do that? Can you tell us more about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, there are so many stories that I come across in interviewing people that Do Dr. Esselstyn is on the phone with them. He goes, "They call me. He called me back the same day." I was like, yeah. "Well, <laughs> that is Dr. Esselstyn." And uh, yeah, he's got a, a slow kind of a interesting draw in his voice, but he's really calming. Yes. Such an incredible human. I, yes, just, he is. I adore him so much. Okay, that's incredible. But wait a minute, where did you two go on a plant-based diet? Tell me. Oh, wait, wait, I mean, uh, so once I watched this um, Forks Over Knives, uh, actually before that, I have a, a short, uh, like, 
I don't know how to make it short, but I have my own <laughs> <laughs> health issues. I was overweight. Uh, I was struggling in my residency training uh, with the health issues. And uh, I was about 220 pounds. And uh, right now my weight is about 145, 250, depending upon the day, depending upon what sugar makes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm 70 pounds lighter. Uh, so uh, during residency training, uh, third year of residency, there was a lot of stress and uh, working 100 hours, almost up to 100 hours a week and uh, didn't have the necessary energy. I wasn't feeling well. And uh, around that time, I happened to uh, read a brochure. Uh, it's a four page brochure on uh, how uh, that's, a, that's actually interestingly, it happened in a grocery store. I was feeling so uh, not so well, like with the low energy and all during the time, uh, feeling uh, dragged and everything. I, I ran into this brochure, which talked about the food choices we make and how we feel. Mm. I was like, I talked about may, cutting out meat might improve your energy levels and like maybe even, uh, you know, have more mental clarity. I was like, this doesn't make sense. But I was like, I was feeling so miserable. I was like, what's there for me to lose? I'm going to try this for a week. And I tried that for a week. I cut out meat for a week. And just, uh, I was still eating dairy products and, uh, uh, but still cu cu cut out the meat. And then within a week, uh, before, I, before I say that I cut out meat, I, you should know about what I was eating then. <laughs> <laughs> Cafeteria. Yeah, yeah. The food was. See, the thing is, uh, I grew up in India. I went to, I moved to US for further training, and I, I adopted a pretty much a, a sad diet, standard American <laughs> diet. It was a failed American experiment. <laughs> it was a fail. So my typical breakfast was, uh, you know, omelets or uh, with uh, uh, like uh, white toast, or sometimes omelets with ham and bacon and sausage and. Uh, on some days, a breakfast would be a couple of donuts and with coffee, and lunch is typically fried chicken with uh, fries and gravy. And uh, well, some days it may be like the, this mesquite turkey sandwich <laughs> with cheese, extra cheese, and and the suppers uh, were usually uh, Shoba used to make delicious uh, Indian curries like uh, chicken and uh, uh, our fish. Uh, and in between uh, lunch and suppers, like, uh, have uh, a snack, freshly baked cookies, <laughs> peanut butter cookies or chocolate chip cookies made especially for the residents <laughs> and the doctors in the doctor's lounge. I had to add a couple of them. So this was my typical, uh, like every day eating like a king or a queen. And uh, if I didn't eat meat in a day, I wasn't, I, I didn't feel like I ate. So I was on, a <laughs> I was on that kind of uh, diet, but I didn't realize that how much it was dragging me down. Mm. So I, I, I changed uh, uh, my eating after I read the brochure and within the next five months, uh, I lost 50, I, I, I thought I'll do just for a week. And uh, after a week I felt better. And I also started exercising within the next five months, I lost 50 pounds. Wow. And then that's when I actually moved to Newfoundland. After I moved to Newfoundland, when I read the, uh, when I um, saw the folks on knives and did the, uh, uh, the personal uh, uh, scientific uh, research and all adopted uh, this plant-based eating. And uh, that helped to lose another uh, 10 pounds. I think the last 10, 15 pounds that I was able to bring, uh, take it off is because I became even more conscious about not just what to eat, but also how to eat. Mm. And that's, I think that made uh, even a more, uh, it gave me more freedom over uh, my, uh, say, you know, emotional eating and the food addictions and all. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, it's, uh, so when we became plant-based, uh, we became exclusively plant-based in around 2012 after, uh, after we saw folks over knives and uh, did the plant-based nutrition courses. And okay, so that's really interesting. So now you have Arjun is going red, saw folks over knives. How did you present this and how did you receive it? Like, oh, you want to go on a bus? <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to hear this. Yeah. So, I, I have a totally different story. But before... <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so funny. Oh, my goodness. So how, tell me your story. 
but before that, I really want to thank you for having us, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. So, uh, like my, my story dates back for a while. I always wanted to be like my dad. Um, he won a prestigious uh, Indian National Award for his um, innovation. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So he won this uh, award from President of India, uh, which is called Bharat Udyog Ratna, for his innovation of uh, low cost techniques and uh, environmental friendly techniques for uh, the manufacture of steel. Wow. And steel is something that we find everywhere, right from our pots and pans to automobiles to skyscrapers. So I wanted to invent something like him in the medical field. So when I was in my medical school, uh, I was always curious, how are things invented in the medical field? Like who writes our textbooks? Who sets our treatment guidelines? Or even how do they come up with the number that 120 by 80 is the normal range for the blood pressure and not otherwise? And even like how do people eradicate diseases in the population level or in the even in the first place, like how can you prevent diseases? So that's when my inclination towards uh, preventive medicine grew. And uh, what I found in my medical school is most of our medical textbooks were written by US authors. So I was like, hmm, maybe people in US know how to invent things. They know how to conduct research. So I wanted to go to US so that I can learn from the best. I can learn how research is uh, done. And I wanted to invent something. So maybe a cure for a disease or something. It didn't matter what disease it was. <laughs> I wanted to invent something. So <clears throat> both of us, we came to US and uh, he wanted to pursue his surgery residency, and but I wanted to pursue a research career. And uh, even back home in medical school, social and preventive medicine was not a lucrative subject. And for some, they didn't even consider as a subject worth uh, pursuing. And uh, uh, basically I wanted to apply for uh, or I wanted to be trained in the basic science of disease prevention. Uh, that's how I was drawn to epidemiology, which is nothing but uh, basic science in disease prevention and identifying the risk factors for disease. Um, so I set out to uh, do epidemiology. And since I wanted to learn from the best, I wanted to uh, go to Hopkins. So after I went to Hopkins, it was a totally different world in itself. So I was able to see how um, research is conducted, basically like how studies are designed, how are they funded, how policies are made, and even how um, studies are analyzed, and even in the first place, how they are presented. So having that inside information really helped me uh, even to see like how research is conducted and also to understand research. Uh, the reason I'm saying this because like most of us, even though we are doctors, we do not have much knowledge about how- <laughs> like You're how so right. Go ahead, <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> So how to understand research, like even if a paper is presented before us, it's very hard to tell us, unless you have that um, uh, discernment about how it was conducted and what was the purpose for it being. And even in the analysis, there are a lot of hypotheses that they go by. And unless you know that, you, you cannot say, okay, this is what it is showing. So having that knowledge, I wanted to come back to the clinical field so that I would be able to serve my patients better. But I almost spent a decade in the research world. And when I wanted to come back, I had a lot of resistance in the clinical community saying, you were so much away from the clinical field. 
So even in terms of your board certification or even in terms of if you want to practice or even get into a residency training, um, it, it would be difficult. And I, uh, the main reason I wanted to get into the residency training program too, that's so that I can get this group of patients to whom I can serve better. But that, that did not happen. And so I was <clears throat> practicing in Hopkins. So meanwhile, like Arjun, like he came to Newfoundland and he Just really- Just for one year. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The plan was one year and we were gonna go back, but it's eight years, we decided to stay here. Yeah. So he was so much in love with the Newfoundland and he, he didn't want to come back. And of course, like when I visited Newfoundland, uh, it was, I mean, it's so beautiful and people are so friendly. And you just keep wondering, is there such a place on a planet? Like if, if you really forget about humanity, this is where people should come. Really, I mean, people are so friendly. And what was striking is the disease, the burden of the disease, and like a lot of deaths due to cancer, due to heart disease. And a lot of this were like chronic lifestyle diseases. And I was like, uh, I mean, th this is what, I mean, this can be definitely solved. Uh, have, when I approached the hospital saying that like, I'm an epidemiologist, people were like, epi what? <laughs> so, <laughs> is there something <laughs> like that? And uh, so even they were not even uh, cognizant of anything existing like that. So they were like, no, 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 we don't want a preventive medicine doctor. We want a surgeon or a family practice doctor so that who can treat this population because there's so much disease. So no amount of uh, convincing worked. And, uh, and, and that took almost two years. And uh, so it was very hard for me to decide that if I'm going to stay here, what am I going to do? I definitely uh, wanted to be helpful and apply my skills here. And then one day just a thought occurred to me, like why am I fighting, trying to fight with the system or trying to convince the hospital that they should have me or do when maybe I can develop my own system and uh, maybe I can empower the community. This, this doesn't need any both certification or anything like as long as I'm empowering the community. And also uh, like while I was in Hopkins, <clears throat> there, there are many things that happened in the Hopkins. Uh, I was really privileged to work with walking legends like people who were behind eradicating smallpox mm -hmm. and uh, Nobel Prize winners. So it, it was really a humble experience. And at the same time, even uh, where, uh, I was trying to uh, tell people here like you can definitely prevent disease. And, and that is something uh, they felt it was a very unknown factor. Mm. Amongst all this, uh, even after having that decade of research, what happened was one day Arjun came home and he said uh, he, uh, he didn't want any meat. Uh, he, he didn't uh, uh, want to uh, drink milk or uh, something. So I said, I can understand why you don't want to eat meat. Um, it, it, it might have some negative impact, but are you out of your mind? Like you're saying that uh, dairy is not good for you, eggs are good, not good for you. And, and that's what we have been bombarded, like right from the childhood, like you want to give your child milk. You want to make sure that they drink their milk and of course uh, have egg or uh, other sorts of things. And then he mentioned about uh, Colin Campbell's research. And I was surprised, okay, I have been through my medical school and I have been through this research and everything, but I haven't heard about uh, this epidemiological study or even I haven't heard uh, 
that anything existed like that. And once he mentioned that it, uh, since I had the research background, it was very easy for me to see like all the research behind it. And it was very easy for me to assimilate. And I was literally flabbergasted. I was said, this existed. I mean, this is not something new. This has been there from such a long time. But why nobody talks about this? Why uh, like people are so skeptical about it? Or why even it is so difficult to bring to mainstream? So having uh, that experience, so that's when it totally took a 180 degrees turn. But before that, you were going to kill me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Before yeah. that 180 degrees turn. <laughs> yeah, the reason I was going to kill him because like after a long day of work, I cooked dinner. Then he, he comes home and he said like he didn't want to have that. I literally feel like choking his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> After a long day, like I prepare something and you say you don't want to eat it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, maybe. It was chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, one of my favorite foods is Indian food. So I need to get some recipes for you guys when we're done, by the way. <laughs> um, but that is so funny because when I came home and I said, I'm done. So I came home to three teenagers and my husband, who's Filipino. And I was like, we're done. We're, I'm not eating meat or dairy. And I threw out everything, literally, <laughs> one night. It's like, we're done. And then I always stayed up to one in the morning going, what am I going to feed my family? <laughs> <laughs> my husband's like, I don't care. Just cook food. I don't care. I'll eat anything. But, um, and that turned out amazing. He lost 50 pounds in three months. My allergies got better. Just incredible stuff. And um, wow, that's, that's so funny. <laughs> so how did you start the journey then of incorporating this not only in your own life, but your practice. I mean, that, that was, to me, was the bigger challenge. I can learn recipes and cook at home, but it, that's the, how do I do this with patients? That is so tough. It was very difficult in the beginning, right? I, I must mm. say it was difficult in the beginning. Uh, when I was talking to the patients, I learned that, you know, we went through 13 subjects in medical school, right, to, in India, like there was 13 subjects, uh, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, pharmacology, microbiology, ENT, ophthalmology, community medicine, general medicine, pediatrics, and uh, surgery. general surgery, orthopedics, obstetrics, and gynecology. Like, but we didn't have a subject called nutrition, and we also didn't have a subject called behavioral counseling. Now it's, it's like, you know, knowing, no, okay, we, now I know what to do, but how do I get this information <laughs> to you? Right. Right? right. Like right. it's, you, you need coaching and training, like, you know, how to change when you are trying to get someone to ask, it's a big ask, like, you know, asking people to change their behavior. I love so, you guys. I think yeah. we're long lost friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're so on top of it you're exactly right but so yeah. how did you decide or how did you learn this behavioral coaching because that's tough well the thing is the, the way i started was you know i'm gonna try to do my best and get this information to the patient as as much as i can and i ha i kept my expectations very low in the sense, I said, like, if I, if I say this, if I share this information, let's say if you're coming to see me with acid reflux, or irritable bowels, or gallstones, or hemorrhoids, or colitis, or, uh, so any of these conditions can be helped with, with the diet. So I, I, kept my, I kept my expectations low, and I would just share this information. You know what, um, Miss, I'm just making this patient up, Mrs. Jones, like, you know, you've been struggling with, uh, this acid reflux and hemorrhoids for a long time. You have taken these, 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 these medications for over 20 years. You have seen three specialists. You know what? I have, you know, some other tools for you. Would you like to learn more about it? Then I would assist the openness of the patient. Like if the, if the patient is open to it, I would say, okay, you know what? You need to, this is what you should eat. This is what you get it out. So, but uh, that, that was in the beginning. So, but the, I kept my expectation low in the sense, if I, if I say this to 100, 100 of my patients, even if 10 patients listen, I'm okay with that. 
So, but surprisingly, what I, what I learned is with PDA, with time period, I've gotten better because what I found is I'm, I'm walking the talk, right? I've transformed my health. I've lost 70 pounds and uh, uh, they could see like, I mean, I have more energy. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, I have my dad's story to share. And so when I started talking about it, uh, not many people were listening. So some days I would come back and say, you know, not many people would listen, I, but I don't, I just kept going. I think one patient really helped me a lot. Uh, she came to see me, she's a young patient, like her thirties and had two children, uh, came to see me for, uh, for having surgery for gallstones. Like she had disabling symptoms from the gallstones. The problem was her BMI, the body mass index, was over 50. She was over 100 pounds overweight compared to her, uh, you know, where, where she, she should be. So the thing is, yes, she needs, uh, she would benefit from surgery because she's having symptoms, but she's also at a high risk. If we do the surgery with that body mass index, she, is, she would be at a high risk of having complications. I said, you know what, like we could do your surgery now, but there'll be high complications, but would you be willing to try to change your diet? These are the things that we could do and maybe bring your uh, uh, weight to a certain level and then uh, in the, in the, uh, close to ideal range, bring it to a body mass index of 30 and then we'll talk about having surgery. Me, I, I even suggested that you keep coming back to me every month and uh, or every two weeks you know, uh, and we'll, I'll follow up with you. We'll see how things are. And if we have to do surgery for you, we'll go ahead and do it. But the thing is what, uh, she did not show up for her follow-up appointments. Uh, I forgot about her. Eight months later, eight months later, uh, the nurse brings this chart and um, this is a new patient. And uh, I look at the, when I look, before I go meet the patient, I looked at the vitals and uh, look at the BMI and uh, the BMI is, I didn't actually, I looked at the vitals, I looked at the name and I went back to my old records to see, I saw this patient and um, uh, this patient's BMI was 50. So I went outside to call the patient in. And this young looking, healthy looking patient and like, you know, she's looked like she's a I know, close to ideal body weight. She was walking in and this didn't make any sense. I, I said, just wait, I'm going to go. I'm going to, I went, I wanted to make sure I'm getting the right patient. So I, I came back inside. I checked the names, cross checked the names and it's the same patient. And she came back and we had a conversation and I was more eager to learn from her what happened. Like she didn't show up for the follow-up appointments and uh, it was eight months later, she has lost over 70 pounds. She brought her body mass index from 50 to 30. And uh, I asked her what happened, like, you know, how, what did you, how did you do this? And she said, I don't know what happened when I left your office room that day. Um, something I felt that you kicked my butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, these are her words. I felt like, you know, you kicked on my butt and after that I never stopped. Oh. And, uh, uh, I, that gave me confidence actually that talking to patients works, right? Because, uh, wow. yeah, talking to patients works. Wow, Eureka, like, you know, because, <laughs> you know, one of the, one of the notion or dictum that you hear from the colleagues is patients don't listen, you know, patients don't listen, like, you know, but the thing is, that's a self-defeating uh, prophecy. Uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. prophecy you're cutting for yourself, like, uh, uh, Anyway, I put that, 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 that uh, prophecy aside and just lowered my expectations. And after that patient, you know, my confidence even built, built up. And I guess uh, even my skills in counseling have gotten better and better and better. And I've been able to uh, gaze uh, the interest level of the patient. Like, is this a patient who's open to this or is this a patient like, you know, not even interested? Mm -hmm. So I would bring it up, but if I see resistance somewhere, I just say, okay, you know what? This option exists, this choice exists, it's up to you. So, but the thing is, is that was on individual level. But what we learned is, you know, this working in this four walls with, with one patient, it's quite draining. Like on some days I see about 35 to 40 patients on a busy uh, day. 
and I'm just like a tape recorder repeating myself. Like if any, if the nurses, so if, if anyone is outside my office room, like 70% uh, of my v visits are spent in counseling and almost I'm repeating myself. Because the thing is, we just don't realize how important is food for our health. Uh, and the most of the diseases are, that I see related to the gut and stomach and uh, even the most common surgical diseases uh, are related to the food. So I feel like I'm repeating myself as a tape recorder. And uh, one thing what we found is uh, we, I wanted to do it after my dad's transformation is to bring it to larger community and uh, do it in the form of work, workshops. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> Like, so, so that's how uh, Arjun's experience was. So I always consider Arjun as smart because uh, he does mistakes. He learns from the mistakes. And, uh, oh, I didn't, know. I, didn't, I, didn't know that. <laughs> I, I didn't know that she considered smart. She's not done. There's, a, there's an insult coming. So hold on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, like I always uh, consider Ar Arjun smart. Like he he does the mistakes, he learns from it, and he he gets that uh, enlightenment. And I consider myself wise because I don't do the same mistakes that Arjun did. <laughs> I learn from his mistakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically, she's saying she's smarter than you are. <laughs> wiser she's wiser, yeah, she's wiser and she's smarter, you know? <laughs> so oh, like, like arjun he used to come and he used to share this like of course like i'm telling this to people and n nothing much is happening of course like if you're telling 200 people maybe 10 people are listening and personally the experience i had in hopkins so oh, i was very lucky because I had been trained to how to bring a change on a population level, not with a single person. So with that training, I definitely knew that this is not going to work. Most of us, we think, okay, if you have the knowledge or like there is so much evidence in plant-based diet. Of course, when people listen to this evidence, it, it is common sense that maybe they should incorporate this. But what people don't realize is change doesn't happen only because you're giving that knowledge or even because the patient has the skills to do it. There is also other missing puzzle, which a lot of people don't realize it. So if you want a change to happen, you have to have these three ingredients. So one is knowledge, of course, like why you want to do this or what you have to do and the skills to do it. And the other one is have the social support to do it. Even if any one of these ingredients is missing, the change wouldn't happen. And even it was very clear for me that let's say if you're doing in a clinic setting, so it will take, if it is a one hour session, it will at least take 24 sessions for you to impart that knowledge or convince the patient about uh, the beauty of a plant-based diet or what it can do, or even that it can reverse. And if it's a half hour session, it will take 48 sessions for you to do that. So it was very clear for me that this is not going to happen in the clinic setting. And <clears throat> at the same time, since I wanted to empower the community, so I thought I have to come up with some model so that uh, the change could happen and people can see results and it would be helpful even for the clinicians because when whenever you write the prescription and send back the patient and when they again come back three months um, you're not so happy about it when you don't see the change or you're trying to just increase the dosage of the medication that doesn't help but when a clinician really sees that the, pa the patient has improved like he's literally overjoyed so as we said, like a lot of uh, like family practice doctors or other doctors, they were very skeptical. So I was like, okay, I know that like Arjun, he's busy in the hospital and this is not something he would be able to do. And this is, and this might not be suited for a clinic setting. Then I said, okay, why not uh, have a workshop? 
And uh, even this concept is not new, like a lot of people in US have this immersion types of workshop, either one week a workshop or three day workshops for this. But even within that, like I knew uh, if I'm going to even develop this immersion workshop, I have to make sure I have all these three ingredients because even in immersion workshops, what happens is people come for those three or one week, they get the knowledge, they get how to do it, and they get the support during that time. But after they're gone, there is no way to track or keep them accountable or like there are people like who may still follow or there are people who may fall off the wagon after some time. So I was like, I have to come with a system so that even this support system is incorporated in a way that it, it, became, it becomes sustainable. So that was my idea of developing the workshop. So initially, I designed for 21 days. Then I knew like nobody would have time to come for that 21 days. Then I reduced to seven days. I was like, even like seven days, unless they're taking a vacation, they won't feel like. So then I was like, <laughs> three days. Okay, just give us your weekend and we will show you like how you can change your uh, health. Yeah, I mean, give, I, us, give us your weekend and I we'll do. get you off of your medications and yeah. we'll show you a way how to maybe add 20, 30 years to your life and uh, you know. Uh, yeah. And also like we wanted to let people know is like health is abundant and this is something it's in their hands. People think okay maybe this is in the hands of my doctor or I'm not able to do this because the society is set up like this or because my environment is like this because of all the fast food so people try to blame on their circumstances or uh, everything that this is not possible but I just wanted to empower them saying that like health is in your hands so uh, when we designed our first workshop and I thought maybe no, nobody would even register for the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> wow. nine, nine brave souls showed up. Yes, yeah. nine people nine, registered yeah. for yeah. the workshop. Yeah. And uh, they didn't believe that we were doing it for the first time. They, they, they said, you guys look like a pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's like, it's, it, that was two years ago. Is yeah. It? yeah, two years. Yeah, yeah so it, in 2016, that's when uh, it started. But I was also cognizant, like, of course, when we associate fees with it, because, because it involves money, like if, when you want to do this workshop. So I was planning to think of a self-sustaining way. So what I mm -hmm. said was, okay, like for three days, uh, you're almost having 60, uh, uh, 60 different meals. Like it's a buffet style. You, you're getting breakfast, lunch, and dinner for, uh, for the workshop for almost three days. And you're tasting almost uh, like 60 different foods. Wow. So if you can just pay to cover the cost of the food and supplies, it's not that you're paying anything to us, like for our services. But like even like, let's say if you go to a restaurant per day, you might be spending $100 for your breakfast, lunch and dinner. So it's, it's that like you're just paying for the food. And of course, since you would be renting the premises and all that. So we really kept the cost low so that this is something that people can afford and not blame it that this, this is something they cannot do. And on top of that, in, when it came to support, so for people who did the first workshop and once they followed this path, they became mentors for the incoming workshop participants. So when they saw this generous gift from us, like once they attended the workshop, they said this was the most, best money that we have spent. And we can't believe like you are giving us so much and that also led them to be so generous to uh, incoming people so they volunteered their time to mentor the incoming so in that way it became a sustainable support and not only that 
we again started a weekly support group meeting for people who completed this workshop. So if they had any challenges for that week, and even in those uh, weekly support group meeting, we showed them like how to cook one dish. So every week they get to see how to prepare a new kind of dish and also address their challenges. And it really, the community grew from 10 people to 200. I, I didn't know when that happened, but yeah, it's all yeah. actually that's that's those are the number of people who finished the program. Like the last workshop, we had uh, 40 participants wow. and we had to say no to about 25 people because the facility that we have here, we can only take up to 40 people. Oh, wow. So and uh, when we started, uh, the, there were family doctors in the community who were telling the patients that their patients is not a good idea to do it. but mm -hmm because they didn't, they didn't uh, believe in what we are doing or they didn't understand uh, this whole impact of uh, plant-based nutrition. But now we have about uh, four of the, like, you know, four other family physicians in the community are actively sending patients here. Uh, and even the local uh, internist and the endocrinologist, uh, he has seen remarkable, uh, like, I can just give you an example of uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jim who did the workshop recently. Um, before we go into that, I want to spend a little bit of time what we do in the workshop, right? Like, so yeah. what is this that we're talking about, right? What we're talking about uh, taking control of your health uh, in your hands with the food, because uh, most of us think that uh, you get like, the, for example, like, you know, if somebody has diabetes or high blood pressure or high cholesterol, they're reaching out to their doctor and the doctor's family doctors, they mention, they probably mention about food, like you got to change your diet and lifestyle. And the next thing they get it is this prescription, right? right. So, and they, you know, they, they path on that, uh, like medications for diabetes. And yeah, most of the time, most of the time, right? They're in this slippery slope, one medication, two medications and three medications. And like, you know, maybe in three or four, uh, in few years, insulin and the, the disease process doesn't stop, right? So that's yeah. what you're saying. So they can give you medications. And it's really important for people to understand medicines are just a band-aid. They're not a cure. That's unless right. it's like antibiotics or something, but yes. exactly. So Yes, so that's, that's right. Uh, so what we're talking about is instead of managing the disease, can we eradicate it? Can we get rid of it? Right? So that's something I think uh, people, some people ask me, uh, <laughs> you know, why you talk about food, you're a surgeon, right? Right, so I, I, I think the reasons are same. The reason, the reason why I became a surgeon and the reason why I talk about food are the same. The reason why I became a surgeon is I want to get rid of the disease. The reason, reason why I talk about food is I want to get rid of the disease. Right, I mean, that's why you, we all go to medical schools to get rid of the disease, right? Yeah. To help people. Uh -huh. Yes, that's right, not just manage it, right? Like, yeah. So, Coming back to the workshop, so what we do is to clear the confusion. We clear, there's so much confusion about what is healthy to eat. So much confusion. So we spent uh, like almost a day in clearing the confusion about what is healthy to eat. We address uh, all the popular nutritional myths that are, that's are out there, prevalent out there. So by end of that day, people are clear. Like, okay, now I get it. Like, you know, this is, this, this is, uh, where I need to get to my eating wise. Then we focus on the second day, we, we focus on inspiring them, motivating them, firing them up. And then after they're fired, and uh, like uh, when I say inspired, and then, <laughs> and then they're, they're, they have, uh, they have uh, cleared their head out, then we give them the tools and then to we show them, show how, them to, how to do it, how to cook, how to shop, how to eat outside, how to deal with the difficult family members, how to deal with your in laws and friends and so and we, how to read nutrition labels. labels and how to eat outside. So these, these are all the things that we cover in the workshop. So during the time, as Shoba mentioned, he, they get to taste over 60 different foods. Wow. And after the workshop, they become so confident in, uh, um, I, I mean, uh, embracing this lifestyle. Uh, initially, they are a little bit anxious. Okay. Can I do this? Yeah. Because they come with the baggage of like, I'm overweight and so much. They had tried everything under the planet. So with that emotional baggage, after this three days, they are so confident. They say, oh, this is something I can do. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, uh, one, well, actually, we ask them to do two things, right? You know, yeah. On the first day, we say, we want you to have open mouth 
because food is going to be coming at you. <laughs> so open mouth. And the second thing is have open mind, yeah. open mind, right? Like, you know, whatever, uh, whatever, uh, you know, you have picked up from the society or from your parents and from the uh, culture, just leave it aside for just three days. We're not asking you to do forever. Just do it for three days. After that, what you want to do is up to you. Right. Right. So, uh, then, uh, once they have the clarity and the skills and the support, support is multi-layer, multi-layer in the sense we are there for them or phone numbers or emails or Facebook and anything that they need, we are there for them. And there is support in terms of from the, the group itself. Everyone who finished the workshop, we put them in a secret Facebook group. Nice. It's a secret Facebook group. So it's a very safe place where they're sharing their stories and recipes and their challenges challenges and uh, so a lot of uh, positivity uh, going on and if everyone is feeling a low or off one day everyone is there to cheer up and boost them up and then uh, just uh, what do you call the uh, scrub them up and then keep them <laughs> back on the path <laughs> so as, as Shoba mentioned support is such an important thing because it's not just you uh, we, like we're all very you know most of us 95 to 99 percent of us are very logical, very smart. If you actually spend a little bit of time looking at the research, it's very clear. The more plant-based foods we eat, the healthier we are. Mm -hmm. The more animal-based foods we eat, the sicker we are. The more processed foods we eat, the sicker we are. But you have to spend a little bit of time understanding that. Once you have the clarity, then the, the most difficult thing is how do we make this happen? Mm -hmm. I think I actually like what you're doing. Like I really love your uh, the website title you have how to help right we're not talking about what the health it's like how to make that health happen mm -hmm. right so uh, the, i think we are pretty much we're doing uh, we're focusing on uh, that how part mm -hmm. and making it happen and it's very hard to do in a clinical setting it is very hard to do in a clinical setting it is i i was started in a clinical setting as a family yeah. practice doctor one patient at a time but you're exactly right it got so exhausting yeah. repeating myself. I created a 30 page handout that did everything. I talked about food addictions and changing habits and what to look in the grocery store and how to read a nutritional bowl. And so I'd start my day. I would look at, okay, I have, you know, 25 patients, which ones am I going to jump on today? <laughs> and I would print that out and have it highlighted, ready to go. I had a highlighter. I went through a spiel, you know, Here's this, you need to come back in a week or two weeks or whatever. Um, and I started looking at marketing. And so I started like, what are they doing in marketing? What are they doing in commercials? And how do they sell things to us? Because that's what I have to do. I have to sell this to them saying my product is better than this product because this product is killing you. My product will reverse disease and keep you out of my office. So, you know, this is kind of how I've started it. And it, it really started to take off. And then we did um, a study in our hospital. I had a friend of mine that was a chef. And we did it for 30 days. The hospital made the food. We had some great success with 30 patients that were employees at the hospital. And then we started a lifestyle medicine clinic in another place. I switched jobs. And um, my first, you know, I, when I convinced the CEO to let me do this because they were looking for some new and attractive thing to bring in more of their employer groups in the local area. And I said, you know, this can actually be really cool. Lifestyle medicine clinic. It's, you know, it could reverse disease, it could save them money. They're like, yeah, I like that idea. Not that they were convinced about the science because I tried that. I was like, but ooh, you know, this, this is a new shiny object. And we were hoping to get 30 people to show up. I had 102 show up for the first visit. And I only had, like you said, I only had space for 30. And so we ended up having to do successive um, classes, but then I ended up going to Florida and other things happen. Um, but it's really fun to see like you're saying, those ripple effects, you know, like you do something and then the, those people help each other and, and mm -hmm. further. Um, I helped one patient in Colorado and she emailed me about two weeks ago how she had sent one of the podcasts that I had done <clears throat> to a, pa a friend of hers from high school that had been diagnosed with um, lupus. And she emailed her all this stuff and she didn't hear from her for about a year. And a year later, she writes her back how she had lost over 100 pounds, the lupus is gone or reversed in some yeah. remission. And now she's helping other people as well. So this is someone that I haven't seen in six years. It's helped someone that's helping other people. I was like, it's just so cool. 
<laughs> it's the coolest thing on earth. I tell people it's veggie crack. You're so addictive. And that's where a lot of my podcasts, I really try to focus on that behavioral part because that's the sticking point. But right, you're right. The social and the, but if I can get someone who's energetic, like you guys, you guys are like sparks, right? You're, <laughs> you're the, you're the contagion in that social network, right? That's going to have a lot of effect and hit many, many people. That's what I'm looking for. It's like, well, why was someone able to stop something and someone else isn't? So I'm always searching for what is the little, the word that are the something that I need to say to just click for someone. There's something about it. It's just something happens. So, but you do get better at it. I agree. Yes, yeah, you <laughs> Having learned many, many, many conversations, but we started together about the same time. I, um, it was 2012 when I literally went switched overnight as well. And I read the China study. Um, yeah, Colin study. Campbell. Yep. Yeah. I love that book. Um, oh boy. So, I got to know, so who cooks all the food for you guys? Do you guys cook all the food for the weekend workshops? Uh, we train the chef because oh, we, okay. we knew like this, this has to be something so sustainable. Like if we just start cooking, we won't be able to manage. And even during the workshop, like I wear two hats right before the workshop starts. Like I make sure everything is organized. Everything has to go. So I, I love the data collection part, like organizing the event and making sure if everything goes all right. And because I have to have the backup plans if some things don't work and they go wrong all the time. Right. And then after the workshop, then I have to wear a different hat of the presenter uh, role. So, so that was uh, another thing too. The other thing I knew that the way the food is presented so if we talk about plant-based food, uh, that may seem something unknown to people, but if you can plantify the foods what people are eating, so that doesn't seem odd to them. So if mm -hmm. I can have the same burger or if I can have uh, literally what I'm, I'm eating, if I'm eating my meat, meat and potatoes, burger, pancakes, it doesn't matter. If, I can have that in a plantified version. I'm more excited to eat and be on the journey rather than thinking over, oh, okay, I have to eat this seaweed salad or something. So what we did is we took a Newfoundland chef. And uh, so she knew like what all the foods that people love having here. Mm. And that's what we plantified. We trained her to cook in a plant-based way. So just swap the ingredients and even... Uh, we had to show her how to cook without oil. So, and so she, she was like, oh my God, even is this something that you can do? But the nice thing was since she was a, che a chef, so she was open to all this training and uh, then uh, she, she would cook and she wouldn't even taste it. <laughs> in the beginning, in the beginning, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but now she's, uh, she's tasting everything. But like, yeah. the thing is, uh, it's uh, it's the perception of it, right? Like yes. you know, yes. the, so, but uh, we are very lucky. We are very fortunate to work with a, a local person here. Her name is uh, Marie Marie Lettinclier. She yes. has cooked for all the ten workshops. Like all, wow. all the ten workshops. Mm -hmm. uh, she does so much uh, hard work, and she cooks. She starts cooking ahead some foods, and she cooks like six, seven, eight hours during the while the workshop is happening. And we are we are also fortunate for. Because most of our previous uh, workshop uh, participants they come and volunteer come back as a volunteer they, yeah. they help cut up the vegetables, they help clean, they help you know organize the table so we have uh, we are very fortunate to have all this community like lending this helping hands to make this happen. We and took about six months before we did the first workshop to train her <laughs> just to train her six months, so then we came up with a menu this is what it 's going to be, and after that we took feedback from the people who did the workshop and then we maybe added one and took out one. But uh, right now it's pretty much 90, 95% of the menu is fixed mm -hmm. because we, we work with what they already know. Yeah. Like, you know, if they know what is pea soup and what is baked beans or what is a lasagna or uh, some kind of uh, in a burger or and pizza, our jigs dinner, our jigs dinner this week, which is a typical Newfoundland uh, dinner. It's called what? jigs dinner. It's yes. a Sunday dinner. With the, uh, yeah, jigs, it's a G, Z as in zebra, I-E-G. J, J as in Jack. 
Okay. So, J I so think our, our local Newfoundland friends will, when they listen to this video, they'll like, you know, you <laughs> guys really <laughs> suck. <Yeah. laughs> it's J I G G S, Jigs Dinner. It's a, Got uh, it. Jigs Dinner. It's called Sunday Dinner. It's okay. uh, basically uh, meat with uh, loaded with uh, uh, vegetables and uh, um, different kinds of gravies and uh, pudding, peace pudding. So we plantified that, like, you know, we, we, we made the uh, shoba and like Murray, they came up with a couple of different types of uh, meatloafs, meatless meatloafs, mm -hmm. right? And then same different, kind, same uh, similar uh, veggies and the gravy and all. So people are really amazed that they could continue to have most of their, you know, yes, you can't almost always have 100% of it, but they don't miss the majority of the stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, one thing we, we keep coming back to them, just to remind them, which they will eventually understand is their, their taste buds change, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So taste buds physically change. Like we, we keep repeating back, like, you know, your taste buds keep physically change in 10 to 14 days. Uh, the cravings, some heart cravings might take up to 60 to 90 days, but uh, you're over it. Like the, within, within a, a week or two, majority of the cravings are gone for most of the people. So, um, once they start tasting the, uh, this, the food that they already know, and they could eventually feel that the taste buds change, they, they stick, most of them stick with it. That's awesome. And you were going to mention a story about a gentleman named Jim. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jim really surprised his, uh, family doctor, his endocrinologist and all, uh, Jim was one of the, uh, he was, he was the sickest patient we had in our November workshop, uh, one of uh, 23 people that we had that weekend. He was, uh, Jim uh, was only 5'2", and he was 239 pounds. So it was keeping his BMI was about close to about 45, and he was on 15 different medications. He was on insulin, uh, he had diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, arthritis, acid reflux, difficulty sleeping, uh, and waking even, up in the waking up in the middle of the night. Even for, difficulty walking. Yeah, like, stiffness. Oh, so so much stiffness. Yeah, arthritis. yeah. Uh, his words were like, you know, when he came to the workshop, it was such an ordeal to for him to walk from the car to the to the hall where we're doing the workshop. Mm. This was when he came. So, three weeks later, three weeks later, uh, we followed up with him. Like we follow uh, with all the workshop participants one on one either at our home or, uh, or by the phone, right? We've, uh, so we, it, this is a three, at a three-week follow-up. Uh, Jim and Jesse came. Jesse, is his, uh, he calls his, uh, that's his wife, but he calls uh, her, uh, the cook or the sidekick. <laughs> 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 yeah, but Jesse was so supportive, right? So oh. three weeks later, uh, his blood sugars were ranging before the workshop they're ranging anywhere from 12, 12 to 20 like i'm going by canadian system in the in the u.s system that would be anywhere from um like close to 12 to 20 anywhere from like 200 to 300 range blood mm -hmm. sugars and maybe so, tell the three day difference yeah. yeah so like after the workshop they came to a range of five to seven like you know within less than 120 with the, this happened within a few days and in three weeks, he came off of uh, his insulin. He came off of four diabetic medications, two blood pressure medications, acid reflux medication. His stiffness of the joints was gone. And uh, he was sleeping better. He used to wake up in the middle of the night uh, to pee. go pee, but uh, that has improved 80%. That was within three weeks. Now we are five months into it. Uh, he's a, he, no, 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 even before that. So when he would tell him what happened when he went to the doctor. So three, just within three weeks. Yes. Uh, yeah. So he went to his endocrinologist and uh, he was totally amazed. He was totally amazed. And uh, later the endocrinologist started, uh, like he, he came to us and he, he started talking the, uh, uh, about this to other patients and uh, uh, yeah, so they, they never thought they would see anybody decreasing their uh, blood sugar. Like with, this, with this approach? But and, like and now, also like uh, they would reduce their medications. They, so now 
the more number of people that they are seeing in the clinic, e even they are enthusiastic. Okay, this is something that is working. Yeah. So Jim, now he's he's down about fifty pounds. Wow. In last five months, and uh, he's off of almost ninety percent of his medications, and he is like go 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 go. He has so much energy, <laughs> and this is uh, this is just one of uh, hundreds of people. We have at least twenty to twenty three people, like in last one uh, and a half year who have come off of their either come off of their medications or insulin or cut down their medications significantly wow uh, uh, who had their, diabetes their acid reflux is gone yeah and uh, like and, and, and the savings about the money for newfoundland yeah right <laughs> savings of money for newfoundland on average newfoundland government pays five, uh, four thousand five hundred dollars per diabetic per year for care of a diabetic Wow. So these 20 patients, 23 patients, they have saved at least $100,000 in last one year. If they be diabetic, like if they didn't go this route, they would be diabetic for the next 20 years. That's $2 million. So where do you, you give them your bank account numbers? Because... <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is, just, you know, we, we, we're just happy that they're feeling better. Like. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah, we, oh my goodness. Is we, don't, we don't make any money out of this. Uh, fortunately, uh, like uh, I have uh, my day job as a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, your passion job is helping yeah. people reverse disease. Yeah. Wow. yeah, but the thing is, we have tried to bring this to mainstream. Right. I, and I'm still working on that within the system, how we can make this happen within the system. Like, so. Uh, so but one thing is, as I said, like I'm fond of uh, conducting research and collecting data. So right now we have data on this 200 patients, which I want to publish so that uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, people can see, and even the Newfoundland government can see like what effect it has. It's not only on the patients, but even on their budget. Like right. how actually they would be saving. And, and that was technically saying, okay, I, we can bring down the burden of the disease rather than being reactionary. There's definitely something that can be done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what have you guys, have you started those conversations with your local hospital administration or government or however, whoever you escalate those things to? We did. And uh, we were met with uh, quite a bit of resistance. Uh, mm -hmm. Still, still working on it, right? Okay. So still working on it. Yeah. It's incredible that even though you have all these people, and even physicians in the community supporting you now, they're still resistant. Yes, because like the, the thing is, uh, see the most of the governmental authorities right now, you know, we gotta, we gotta talk about this, right? Most of the governmental authorities right now, they're going by Canada Food Guide, mm. right? So which is similar to- uh, like Ours, I'm sure. USDA, you know, Food Guide. Right. But what not many people understand is there is influence of industry in making yes. the Canada Food Guide. Exactly. And it's not based on the best research, best evidence. So, but the governmental authorities like to go with what the government, you know, uh, so it is an uphill battle, but I think it will, I'm hopeful, I'm positive it will happen because we knew that the smoking is bad for us in 1920 and 1930. It took about 1964 for Surgeon General to say, hey guys, smoking is bad for us. Right. And then it took another 25 years for, people, for us to actually make policies against smoking. Eventually, just in maybe the last five to 10 years, people actually cannot smoke around the hospital. I'm hoping that maybe in the next 20, 30 years that if people want to eat that bag of chips or fried chicken, they probably have to walk out of the hospital and have that. <laughs> That would be the that would be the change, right? Is to actually change what our hospitals are feeding our patients. Do you guys know um, Dr. Robert Osfeld? <laughs> Do you know a Dr. Robert Osfeld in at Montefiore in New York? Yes, yes, uh huh. Yeah, he's doing yeah. amazing work. Yeah, he's doing some really incredible stuff. So, but yeah, you're. But it takes people like you that actually makes things change. But the nice thing about today's world from 50 years ago was that we had the technology, right? So you have social media. So the plant-based movement is really taking off because it, it's so easy to show videos and people can watch them in their home and there's forks over knives and you know all these amazing resources. So I'm hopeful that it will be before I'm dead 
Can we see? <laughs> that people eating bag of chips or fried chicken out of the hospital. <laughs> right. Or the... that, um, I thought uh, it would be nice to mention this. So most of the outlets here, like restaurant, we don't have any major restaurants uh, like in US. Mm. We have uh, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and like... A Chinese place and, and a and subway, subway and a local and couple of uh, pizza delight pizza and a, delight. very few restaurants. We're talking about uh, for a population of uh, eight to 10,000 in this and, community. And, and Tim Hortons. So mm. you know what? Like, of course, Tim Hortons. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when uh, the community here uh, was changing, they were actually demanding like, okay, can we have soy milk instead of uh, uh, like two person milk or one person milk. So when they saw the demand, Tim Hortons here started carrying soy milk, which didn't happen anywhere. Like even in St. John's, they don't carry soy milk, but based on the demand. And the another outlet, uh, it's uh, Extreme, Extreme Peter. Extreme Peter. It's a Peter shop, yeah. Right now uh, on the board, they have this uh, plant-based options because now they have seen that people are ordering in a way that we recommend. So it's funny, they call it as Rayapudi diet. <laughs> and, and for people like who don't know what to order, just, just get that rye pudding. <laughs> so they, say they add that stupid rye pudding diet, right? Like, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I may just title this the rye pudding diet. The di no, no. Like <laughs> You're the, quite the duo. I mean, what an interesting bringing together of some amazing forces, right? So you have the clinician in the clinic, you're seeing the inside and outside of patients. And then you have this amazing epidemiology background and also a physician and you like to project manage and organize. I mean, what a wonder. And you're in a place that, you know, you'd mentioned to me before we started the new, well, the number one killer in Canada is cancer, whereas yeah. here in the United States, it's heart disease. But in Newfoundland, you have the even higher concentration so that the disease burden of cancer is even greater. Yes, yeah. incredible. Uh, Newfoundland is uh, number one in terms of uh, stomach cancer, colon, colon cancer. Uh, I think number two in breast cancer uh, and uh, diabetes. The people and the percentage of obesity. When you compare it with the rest of the province of the Canada, the burden of disease is so high here. Yeah. And funeral home is busy than the hospital, I would say. I mean, wow. it's really sad. And even within a couple of months, uh, uh, like we have lost so many people. So it, it, it really feels sad. And, and that what even uh, makes us, as we said, people are so nice here. And uh, we really think it would be so nice to see if the burden of disease come, comes down here. Right, absolutely. Now, when we say disease, instead of talking in terms of disease, these are living, breathing people yeah. who are dropping dead. Yeah. Now, who are dropping dead for simple things that could be done, like, you know, it's just they, they need to be shown that this can be done. This can be done yeah. uh, right, in their, right yeah. in their kitchens. It's, it's almost like you have a sense of urgency, right? So now I, the way I practice, I'm actually doing telemedicine. So I'm I'm online with patients. And so it's really interesting. So I'll have patients who have, you know, all sorts of issues, diabetes, GERD, because I get their history and as we're talking and I was like, oh, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, a, a 15 minute visit supposed to only last 15 minutes goes into 30, 45 minutes. And I'm sure that's not what they were wanting, but it's been really fun. I've actually had patients, even in, I've been doing this for about eight months, call back just to say, you won't believe this, but my stomach pain is gone. I've had it for 20 years. And mm -hmm. I just called you for a UTI and you mentioned changing this and that, and I can't get over it. And I'm like, well, there you mm -hmm. go. So, but you're exactly, it's a sense of urgency, right? Like I can't not say something because this person could die if yeah. I don't. It's like, it's a really, almost it's a heavy burden. Like you have to know this. If you choose not to, cool. I've done, I've, I've checked off my thing. I've done what I need to do, but you, I got to share because if I don't share, I'm, I, I meet my maker in the end of this. I've got to, I got to do what I got to do. So that, that's how I see it. Yeah. You're doing amazing work. Yeah. But boy, you guys are so interesting. I could talk to you forever. Um, what is your, what is your future goals? Like how often are you having the meetings? What would you like to see happen? Uh, there are lots of versions of this. Uh, future goals is uh, 
uh, we want to put ourselves out of business, <laughs> right? People ask me like, uh, uh, what will you do if everyone gets healthy? I'll say, I'll go cook or I'll, go go, I'll do gardening. <laughs> like last year, we grew about 700 pounds of potatoes in our backyard. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. funny. People in India think you are growing in Newfoundland. Like it's so cold here. Like how, how are you growing things here? Yeah. Wow. So that's uh, like we uh, want to take this message to a bigger audience. One thing is we like to see this come as a mainstream uh, thing. Like incorporate this, and uh, uh, we want to create a freestanding gift of health center, health and wellness center where people can actually come and uh, even stay as an inpatients. Uh, that's one thing. And uh, we both are working on, uh, on our books uh, to spread this message to a larger audience. And uh, what, <laughs> what, what, yeah. what do you see? <laughs> like, as I said, I always wanted to invent something. So I used to think maybe I have to do something big, like, uh, uh, like something like a cure for a disease or anything but like what I realized is this is it I mean you, you can prevent disease it's it's not a rocket science or it's not something like major that you have to do what you have to do is whatever you're putting in your body that that's what it's building your body and uh, if you can have your health and to me what health means health is something it's not just a mere absence of disease but it is something like where you can uh, be energetic and be with your loved ones and do the things that you love and have that mental clarity to do the thing and that that's what health is and this is something that, that you can have and you, you don't have to depend on anybody to have this and this is something I want to give them as a gift. And uh, this is the message I want to spread. So th this is not an invention, but this is something that can be done on a population level. <laughs> but I, think, I think we're reading some notes. Uh, there is some invention about how we're delivering. Yeah. Uh, how we're delivering this. Because uh, one thing we... Uh, I think we have made some steps, progress is how to get this message even after the workshop is done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are people who did other kinds of programs and came back and gave us feedback saying that they found that there is so much more support uh, with the way we are doing. So if you want to say that you haven't, you, you, can, you have invented like maybe the way to deliver it. <laughs> And also, uh, right now, like people not only from Newfoundland, but even people from U.S. Uh, yeah, we have had people come from, from Chicago, Chicago, flew from Flo Chicago. Florida, we have people from Florida. And also from here, what's the French island? Yeah, there is a, a French island nearby. It's called St. Pierre Miquelon. For the next workshop, we have four people coming from that. Yes. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, I mean, this I'm, is how really? I see I see that you guys are, one, you want people to thrive, right? You want to go beyond health, but actually thriving. So it's one yes. thing to eliminate disease and get you to a baseline, but what allows you to move beyond that? So that's what you're doing. And you're finding a really successful way of doing it because you're incorporating all the things that we as humans need, the knowledge, like you said, the skill set, and the support because we're social animals. But what's really cool is that you guys are just in love with the fact that you're seeing success. You're just like a, you're, you were born to be physicians, right? Because you want to heal and that's what you are. You're healers. But this is what I see that you're inventing. You're inventing new futures. Are you kidding? You're incredible. I mean, that's amazing. You're saving lives and you're inventing new futures for people. They have no idea the context of what's going to happen for their children and their grandchildren. I mean, you're it's way beyond what, you're just inventing a piece of metal to put in some medical device to stick in a hip or something. I mean, <laughs> you're changing lives. It's pretty cool. So, wow. You guys are just in fun. All right. So <laughs> I guess we should probably end at some point, but I just want to say thank you again for joining me. And it was such a pleasure and honor to speak to you. And you guys are amazing. And then thank you for having us. Oh, wow. I'm sure we could do it again. I would love, would love to maybe we can do something on a regular basis because I think you guys have some really cool stories and some things to learn that we can learn as physicians who are doing this other places. Well, this is what's working in your community and 
it'll probably work in others as well. So mm -hmm. cool. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you so again. Much for us. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>